Today on Motor Week, Richard Hammond drives the new RAV4 on an arduous, soft road course. Glenda McKay gets a surprise when she test drives the new ProDrive P1. And Chris Goffey tests the new sporting estate from Alpha, the Sport Wagon. Ah, the old 4 by 2 Still work at a building industry. I'll fix that with a bit of 4 by 2 love. Well, there is some 4 by 2 in this picture. Can you tell where? Yeah. It's not any of this, it's the car, because it's the new Toyota RAV4, and for the first time there is a two-wheel drive version. Toyota tell us it's not then a 4x4, it's a 4x2. Toyota claimed to have invented the SUV concept with the original RAV4 six years ago. And who's to argue? It was the first soft roader, light, nimble and fast on the road and about as much use off-road as an oven glove to a card sharp. This then moves the whole sector on, because now we want our soft roaders, well, a bit more like our proper off-roaders, apparently. Toyota reckoned that we want a more mature car, a bigger, butcher, bolder car. And that explains why this one is bigger, butcher and bolder. Toyota aren't so daft as to make any kinds of claim that the new RAV4, much like the old RAV4, is really any kind of genuine off-roader, especially as there's now a two-wheel drive version. What they say is it's basically a styling exercise, and that's fine. I've nothing against styling exercises. What I don't understand is why choose off-road? Off-road is not really very cool. Still, let's find out if it really does have any off-road capabilities, because I've built something a bit special. I've been busy. Have a look. I've built this. It's a special, unique, soft road, of course. And your car comes along here, down into this terrible chasm here, and then it's going to come up the very steep side, over there, over this big log, and then these boulders will test the articulation of the axles. Real off-road. I'm sure Toyota's researchers are perfectly correct when they say that the SUV sector is now more mature, we want bigger, stronger cars. The only thing is, the whole idea of having a light off-road or a sports utility vehicle is pretty daft to start with. So to try and make it sensible is, well, to lose the point really. And the result is, well, this, we get a car that doesn't feel as sharp, as agile and as edgy as the original RAV4, which is a shame. That said, the ride is incredible. It soaks up small bumps and undulations in the road beautifully. There is a bit of chop backwards and forwards just because we're in a very short wheelbase, quite tall car. The steering is a little bit numb though, it doesn't exactly tell you a lot of what's going on. It's lost that kind of almost hot hatch feel that the old RAV4 had. They've also done a lot of work to reduce the noise and it's worked. It's very quiet in here for a car with such a bluff front end. You'd expect a lot of wind noise and clatter going on, but it doesn't. There's another big difference between new and old. Previously, it looked as though they started with the three-door and the five-door was, well, a kind of afterthought. They just stretched it a bit and it never really looked right. But now for new RAV4, well, it almost looks as though they started with the five-door and shortened it to make the three-door. The whole thing looks, well, a lot more resolved, a lot more finished. Inside, both the three and five door versions are light, bright and feel well put together, if not exactly inspiring. Performance from the 1.8 and 2 litre engines isn't exactly in the startling category and it certainly seems to have lost quite a lot, if not all, of that hot hatch feel. In my mind, the five door is the more resolved design. It looks more complete, more as though it was set out on purpose to look the way it does. The swage and cut lines are great. They look better in lighter than darker colours. In a dark flat blue, a five-door looks decidedly average. It's going to be available from launch with a choice of two engines, both petrol, a 1.8 and a 2.0-litre, both pretty new engines. You can have a choice of four-speed automatic or five-speed manual gearbox, and that big issue that it can be with either four-wheel drive or a 4 x 2 two-wheel drive. And as somebody asked, well, oh, great, which side do the wheels drive on? I think it's front-wheel drive. By spring next year, there will be a further option of a diesel, which Toyota reckon will be pretty popular, and they're probably right. It's
It's a shame, really, that Toyota missed an opportunity to move the SUV sector on rather than just jumping on a bandwagon that they invented in the first place. Because the new RAV4, well, it's arguably the best of the SUVs, but only because it does all the same things that the others do, just a little tiny bit better. It doesn't set out and do anything that none of the others can, if you see what I mean. In other words, it's nothing like as fresh and different as the original RAV4 when that hit the market. There is good news financially, though, because it starts at under £14,000, which is very good value. You do get a lot of kit for your money. And the RAV4 is still a very, very good car. It's just nothing like the original RAV4. Now, I am really excited today because my agents rang up and said they've got a job for me test driving the new P1. 280 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 in under five seconds, and it's four wheel drive, and I'm so excited. And the lads have brought one along especially for me to try, and it's in here. Hang on a minute. <laughs> I thought you brought a P1 along for me to try. I'll have to get to the bottom of this. Now, Richard, you normally drive that really fancy rally car over there. Why have you traded it in to drive the cart? Well, one of the main attractions at Goodwood Festival Speed this year is the soapbox race. And so ProDrive have taken the opportunity to give their junior engineers a chance to develop and build a prototype vehicle. I see. So develop it. How much does it cost to develop it? The competition rules uh, state that you're only allowed to use £1,000. It's looking pretty good for a £1,000 and how, much, how long does it actually take to actually design it and develop it from beginning to end? They've been working pretty hard, I'd say, for two months. And what kind of top speed does it do? Well, in testing, we've had it up to 60 miles an hour. But it hasn't got an engine in there. No, it's all right, you've got brakes. <laughs> so you just go up a really steep hill and sort of like let it go. Yeah, it's... And is it frightening when you're, uh, when you're going that sort of speed? No, it's no problem. It's very, very stable and uh, does all the right things. The big question that everyone wants to know is how does it compare driving a cart like this to the big rally car there? The rally car's got a bit more power. Um, it's got three pedals. This only has one, which is where the accelerator would usually be. <laughs> but you, how did you enjoy it? It's fantastic. And you're going to win at the festival? Um, That's our main objective, obviously. I don't believe it goes 60 miles an hour. I think you better show me how it works. Let's go. Fantastic, Richard. That was brilliant. I'm convinced. But uh, is there any chance of going one of uh, the bigger ones? Yeah, sure. In fact, I'll join you in the rally car. Brilliant. Let's do it. <laughs>
had the most brilliant day today driving these two cars, both with the same name, but both very different. I think I'll stick to using this one for going up and down the motorways, but when it comes to having a bit of fun on those uh, Yorkshire hills, I think I'll give this one another go. Join us after the break when Chris Goffey puts the Alpha Sport Wagon through its paces on Motor Week. OK, true confessions time. I used to be an Alpha addict in the 70s. I had an Alpha Sud 1.5 Ti and I loved it. I was really hooked. It meant I could attack anything on the road and pass it no matter how many litres or cylinders it had. It was wonderful. In the 80s, I kicked the habit because it seemed to me Alfa Romeo had become unreliable, the depreciation was horrendous, they'd lost their way, their styling, their brio seemed to have gone. Well, now in the 90s, they've got it all back again. The styling, the performance, the appeal, the sexiness of the cars is back in full force. And this is the latest example of the breed, the Alfa Sports Wagon. It's the touring version of the 156, which of course has proved to be the most popular Alfa Romeo they've ever made. As soon as you get on the move, it's obvious there's been no compromise on the 156 Saloon's excellent handling and ride. It might be a bit sharper than you're used to over bumps and thumps than the average estate car, but you're willing to put up with that in return for pin sharp steering and road holding that's like a leech. Now this car is a two litre twin spark and it's fitted with Alfa Romeo's Seller Speed transmission, complete with controls on the steering wheel for up and down changes. It might suit uh, Schumacher, but personally I don't like it. I prefer a five speed manual and I also prefer to have control over the engine myself. If anybody's going to rev up the engine for a down change, I prefer it to be my throttle foot and not an Italian computer. Of course, if the Italian designers had simply put a box on the 156 boot, they would have had their estate. But it's notoriously difficult to make a good looking estate car out of an established saloon car design. So they've actually gone for expensive new doors with a new aerodynamic line to the car. Although why they've put conventional door handles at the front here and funny little plastic pull ones on the back, I don't know. Why not have uniformity of handles? And they've hinged the rear door a long way forward on the roof. And the idea of that is that when you open it up, there's very good access to the load area. And once you're in the load area, a use of nets that I haven't seen before that works very well. There's a clever series of attachment points, so you can stretch a rectangular net on either side, across the back, or even diagonally across the boot floor. And there's another net extending up from behind the back seats to stop loads or a dog hurtling forward into the passenger compartment in an accident. And if the kids are being a real pain, well, there's a gladiator net to strap them down in the back. Not bad rear legroom for the rear seat occupants. Asymmetric split rear seats, as you'd expect for an estate. The mandatory ski hatch, darling, to put the skis through. And more than a few minutes work to get rid of that uh, dog net and luggage guard over the top if you want to fold the whole lot down and make it a proper estate car. <laughs> As with the 156, it's a nice driving environment. It's very comfortable. Lots of handy cubby holes for distributing all the paraphernalia of long distance driving. And instead of fake wood, well, you've got fake carbon fiber on the center console. While the twin spark engine's been around for a very long time and has proved itself in terms of performance and reliability, 
for me, the most attractive Alfa Romeo engine has always been their lovely V6. And especially the architectural style of the engine. When you open the bonnet, it just looks so brilliant. You just want to keep showing people. And when you're on the move, well, the snarl of that lovely engine note just hasn't been reproduced by any other car manufacturer. For me, this is the best of the bunch. This is a very different kettle of fish. Lovely six-speed manual gearbox, none of that cellomatic deciding when to rev the engine up and when to change gear. And in front of you, a V6, two and a half litre, developing 190 brake horsepower. That gives you around about a seven second naught to 60 in a top speed, around 144 miles an hour. And above all, you've got instant positive response and you're in control. <laughs> Just listen to the noise of that engine. <laughs> like the 156 itself, the Sport Wagon comes with 1.6, 1.8 and 2-litre four-cylinder engines. That lovely 2.5-litre V6 and a 2.4-litre turbo diesel. There are three trim levels, standard, Lusso and Veloce, and prices range from 15 to £23,000. I always used to think that my old Alpha Sud 1.5 Ti was the ultimate machine for the family man who still could be a bit of a hooligan. Now I'm starting to think that perhaps it's met its successor. If MPVs had been around back in the 60s, then Cliff Richard and his cheesy mates could have ditched the double-decker in favour of something a little more practical for their summer holiday. Nowadays, of course, their choice would be endless, and this is the latest to join the herd or flock of MPVs. It's the all-new Toyota Previa, and it arrives just about in time because the old one was well past it. What it looks like from the outside is important, sure, but not that important. It's an MPV. If you want to go posing down the high street, any MPV comes a long way down your list. Somewhere after Nissan Micra and Peruda Nipper, I suspect. No, what matters here is the inside. So what do we get up here at the pointy end? It's quite a comfortable driving position. You know it's not a car. It does feel quite high up, but everything is well spaced out. The dashboard looks good. It's got the same bulbous bit in the middle, perhaps carried over from the old one. But other than that, very modern, very striking and sensibly laid out. And best of all, we've got loads of places to put all those bits of kit that you accumulate on a long journey. There are storage pockets everywhere. But even this isn't where the real action is. No, the real place to be in any MPV is in the back. Cheers, boss. It's actually not a bad place to be in here at all, whereas the old Previa felt pretty kind of cramped and claustrophobic. It feels pretty spacious in here. It's available with either seven or eight seats. In eight seat configuration, you get two bench seats. In seven seats, you get individuals, so they're all completely adjustable all over the place. And unusually for MPVs, there's quite a decent boot out the back as well, which is good news for longer trips with loads of people. All in all, not a bad place to be at all, which is good news. You can see echoes of the previous model's smooth shape, but it's been given edges and curves to bring it into the new millennium. There is maybe something of a sleeker version of the Mercedes van-based MPV somewhere in there. Now let's just keep in mind, this is an MPV. It has more in common with a van than with a hot hatch, so we're not expecting sparkling performance. But the Previa does handle itself pretty well. The body control is fantastic. There's barely any roll through the faster corners. Power at the moment comes courtesy of, well, a choice. You can have either the 2.4-litre VVTi engine, petrol, or 
the 2.4 litre VVTI petrol engine. That's it. You've got no choice. And it's not a bad unit. It feels like a diesel, to be honest. Very torquey, lots of low down power. So minimum effort required in moving either through town or cruising. There will, however, soon be another choice of one of these new all singing, all dancing, common rail direct injection diesel engine, which I guess they've got to have because everybody else has got one. Despite the surprisingly good handling, that engine is ultimately what lets it down. There is enough torque at the bottom end, but you do find yourself waiting for something, anything to happen as the revs rise, and it simply doesn't. On paper, the figures aren't too bad. Maximum speed, 115 miles an hour, 0 to 60 dash in about 10.9 seconds. But in real life, it does disappoint. But it's not all bad news. The Previa does claw back a bucket load of points for the quality of the ride, which is excellent. Velvet smooth over even the bumpiest of roads and extremely quiet. With the arrival of the new breed of mini MPVs, not many people really need expensive full-size MPVs like this class. But if you have or are planning a larger family, or maybe you just have so many friends you have to have it for parties, then the Previa, with its quite good looks from the outside, torquey engine, newly revised interior, has got to be worth considering. Heidi, I'm home! Join us next week on Motor Week when Richard Hammond drives the Citroën Plurial in France and Ken Gibson drives the Skoda Fabia in the good old US of A.